Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, here we are, Think Tech. And we have Mina, Marco, and me on Monday about energy, uh, as, we, as we like to do every, every second Monday. And we have them both on the phone from their respective corners of the state. Um, Mina from Kauai, Mina, Mina Marina from Kauai, former chair of the PUC and now uh, an energy consultant under Energy Dynamics. Welcome to the show, Mina. Hi, thanks. It seems like it's been quite a while since I talked to both of you. <laughs> you, you can run, Mina, but you can't hide. We'll find you. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> and Marco Mangelsdorf, who travels everywhere, and who in fact is now in, what, in California. Marco Mangelsdorf of ProVision Solar in Hilo. Welcome back to the show, Marco. Well, much aloha, you two. It's, uh, it's always a treat to get the, the magnificent trio back on the same show uh, <laughs> again that happened. So it's fantastic to be back with you. <laughs> okay, well, it is an interesting week for energy, and that is we're going to have the Maui Energy Conference um, in a couple of days from now. Uh, so, Mina, you're going to be speaking there at the Maui Energy Could you talk about what's happening at the Maui Energy Conference? Yeah, the... Um the theme of the, the conference is the business of carbon. And I, uh, the panel that I'm on is um, called the Limits of Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative. So it's a review of the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative since it's celebrating its 10th anniversary this year. Yeah. Kind of a look back and, and look forward. Um, of HCEI, and joining me on the panel, the panel is moderated by um, William Geis, the Executive Director of the Hawaii Solar Energy Association, and I'm on the panel with um, Alan Oshima, the CEO of Hawaiian Electric Company, and Gerald Sumida, who, um, you know, for quite a while served as the um, chair of the steering committee of HCEI. Mm -hmm. What are you going to talk about? But, um, for me, just the origins of HCEI and as I saw it through my involvement. And, you know, I, I take the, the title of the panel very serious, the limit. So basically touching on what I saw as um, some of the challenges of HCEI and uh, why it's sort of, from my point of view, kind of fallen off the table and doesn't seem as significant, uh, doesn't seem to have been playing a significant role in the last um, at least five years or so. Yeah, I, HCEI, okay. at the outset in 2008, when it first got started, it was uh, really more a concept than an organization. And it was all around um, this fellow, I can't remember his name, who was from the Federal Department of Energy who came around well, and well, offered money. It was me. Well, it was Bill Parks. And Bill, Bill Parks, Park, was, right, was, right. Right, from the Department of Energy. And, you know, the, the from... The onset of HG and I was a really good alignment of various parties and partnerships. You know, so you, you you had this convergence of state, federal, private sector, uh, from the administration, the legislature, uh, Office of Energy, University of Hawaii sort of aligned in moving in one direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but you're right. And it hasn't been, it hasn't been, it's been in declining activity, I would say, over the past few years. So maybe this will, uh, yeah. maybe this will reinvigorate, uh, you know, the program uh, well, because of your panel. Well, when, well, I think, you know, one of the points that I want to bring up that has always been a concern of mine is, you know, uh, especially as a legislator, is that, you know, what we're trying to do in Hawaii is transform. And you cannot transform based on election or political cycles. You know, so I, how do you have this continuity 
for a transformation that is going to take more than a decade. Well, uh, let, me, let me put that question you know, to Marco, Mina. I think that is mm -hmm. always the question of the day. And, and right now, you know, we're, we're in another, in, in my view, we're in a period where we need to focus on transformation, but we don't know exactly how to do it. So, Marco, what do we need to do mm -hmm. to get things going again? Well, I, I think I would dispute the notion that we haven't really, that we've been stuck uh, all that much. I mean, the amount of renewable energy going into our island grids has been increasing uh, significantly at various paces over the past 10 years since the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative was uh, announced, uh, gosh, you know, already 10 years ago or so, October, I think it was uh, 2008. So, you know, by what metric should we measure progress? I mean, there's the 100% the, the renewable energy by such and such a date, but I mean, that's going to take a considerable time, more time and effort to get there. So, you know, it begs the question, but what metrics should we use to, to judge our progress? Well, it's on, we don't have a metric island. per se. And I'm, and I'm thinking that, uh, you know, one of the points we need to discuss today is a metric, and that is the amount of, and you follow this closely all the time, uh, the amount of solar that is being installed on rooftops in the state. Um, and in fact, you wrote a piece for the Star Advertiser last week uh, indicating that, uh, surprise, uh, the amount of the permits and the solar being installed in, in what, the Big Island uh, has dramatically increased. So can you talk about that and can you talk about why? Sure, I'd be happy to. Well, a little background first. Last year in 2017, if you look at the total number of photovoltaic system permits issued by the four counties of our state, uh, Kauai, City and County of Honolulu, Maui County and the Big Island, they, we had the lowest number of PV permits issued uh, in the past 10 years, in the past 10 years back in, in, in 2017. So the solar coaster had uh, slowed considerably from the halcyon days of 2011, 2012, 2013, when things were going like, uh, like gangbusters. So in a sense, we kind of have nowhere to go but up, hopefully at this point. And the permits number is one of the easiest and, and kind of in real time data mineable uh, metrics out there in terms of the, the activity in the solar industry in terms of rooftop solar. So uh, yes, last month uh, in February marked the fourth straight month uh, that November, December, January, February, where the number of PV permits was higher than the uh, same month a uh, year before. So that's, uh, that's the beginning of at least the mini trend. I mean, four months of data and four months of increases. And uh, what that's due to, uh, I, I think at least part of it is that uh, battery storage is now becoming more, uh, more routine and more of a norm as far as new systems going in, the, uh, the larger and larger percentage of them uh, having and requiring battery storage. So I think some of the kinks and, and, uh, and challenges both for permitting and also uh, regulatory approval as well as approval from the utility company, the kinks have been worked out to some, to some extent. It was a learning curve and now we've kind of gotten over the hump in a way and we're beginning to see uh, batteries uh, deployed on the customer side of the meter as more and more of a, uh, of a normal and not so unusual event. Yeah, well now, and now we have some action in the legislature and Mina, I'm sure you're aware of this and, and uh, in the Maui conference, you'll undoubtedly r run into uh, Roz Baker, Senator Roz Baker from Maui, who's, um, you know, uh, who is advancing um, bills for uh, tax credits, including tax credits uh, for storage, including tax cre credits for separate storage, you know, add-on storage, which has really been a kind of a problem. Um, so that will, that will undoubtedly increase the amount of rooftop solar we have, won't it, Mina? Well, it, it could, but again, you know, you have reduced demand out there, too. I, I think one of the problems that we um, are faced with is, you know, the majority of the population or the majority of electricity customers still really haven't benefited from this 
uh, focused on renewable energy, and I think this is one of the challenges of the Hawaii Clean Energy Initiative and Hawaii's energy policy, that we're not taking a total system look at, at um, how, moving forward, um, you know, who exactly is benefiting from this. Um, you know, you, you still have at least 70% of the electricity customer base reliant on the electric utility. But, you know, the electric utility is burdened with increased costs in trying to modernize the system and rebuild the system to become um, uh, more renewable. I mean, it, it, so I have, you know, when we're, we're looking at building permit, it's a snapshot of the total system. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure if it's going to get us there in an equitable fashion. Yeah, you know, well, it's we a good question. Question is whether whether these uh, these these um, bills are going to pass and whether they're going to have an effect mm -hmm. on the process that Marco was talking about. Marco, do you have any thoughts? I mean, what, what exactly do the bills provide and how likely is it they're going to pass here in 2018? So the only one that I am closely tracking, which is most, will be most impactful to, to the photovoltaic uh, PV industry in Hawaii and also to storage is Senate Bill 2100, which was introduced by my friend Senator Lorraine Inouye, as well as a number of other supporters uh, back at the beginning of the session. And SB 2100 passed the Senate last week after getting through Lorraine's committee, the Energy and Transportation Committee, and then the, the WAM, the Ways and Means Committee, uh, and is now in the hands of the House and has been referred to Chris Lee's committee, which was MENA's old committee, the Energy and Environment uh, Committee in the House, and then assuming it gets out of Chris Lee's committee would go to the Finance Committee and then go to a floor vote. So there's still, of course, uh, the reasonable possibility that it will change in the House. And right now, the bill would do two, two big and important things. Number one, it would ramp down over time the state renewable energy tax credit, which is something that various parties in the ledge have been trying to do over the past several years but failed last session and failed the session before that. So it ramped down 35% tax credit over time to a smaller percentage. And second, it would also establish a separate state tax credit to add energy storage batteries to existing renewable energy systems and the way the bill is uh, came out of the Senate would be 25% or $5,000, whichever is less for let's say a homeowner who has an existing net energy metered system to add storage to their home. And I happen to believe that storage on both sides of the meter, both cited at customers, homes and businesses, as well as over time, utility scale storage at power plants and substations makes sense and is worth supporting in terms of uh, tax dollars. I believe Mina and I have a, have a friendly uh, difference of opinion on that, but, and she can certainly speak to herself, but I happen to believe that what batteries do provide and will provide even more so over time is a public good that is worth supporting uh, on a modest level. And that's what I think SB 2100 would do. Well, we're going to talk about that issue right after the break. But let me ask you, $5,000, and the max would be $5,000 on this additional storage, that's not going to pay for storage for most homeowners. That's just not enough money to pay for the average storage installation. Um, so I guess the intention on that bill is to support it, but not cover its entire cost. Am I right? Well, let me add one more thing that's really important, Jay, which is uh, last Friday, uh, March 2nd, the IRS issued what's known as a private letter ruling, or PLR, that specifically for this one particular taxpayer would specifically allow for the addition of battery storage 
to an existing photovoltaic system, and as long as that battery storage was charged 100% by solar, in this case, 100% by solar, then the addition of that battery storage to existing PV system will, in fact, qualify for the investment tax credit, the federal investment tax credit of 30%. So if you take, let's say, uh, the addition of a Tesla Powerwall, for example, at let's say ten, twelve thousand dollars. Let's just make the math easy, really easy. Let's say it's ten thousand dollars, and you have a thirty percent tax credit possible from the Fed. Says so three thousand plus a twenty-five hundred dollar tax credit from the state, assuming that SB 2100 goes into law, that comes out to $5,500 off of 10000 which reduces the cost by more than half. So you're, you're in the business, Marco. Is this going to increase the installation of rooftop solar? Uh, I think it would, would dramatically increase the addition of retrofitting battery storage to many of the 80,000-plus net energy metered customers across our Hawaiian islands. Okay. All right. There you have it. I, uh, we're going to take a break, and we're going to come back, and we're going to let Mina you know, talk about the policy issue uh, over, over these tax credits and incentives. We'll take a minute. We'll be right back with uh, Mina Morita and Marco Mangelsdorf. Hello everyone, I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. Aloha, I'm Kili'i Akina, and I'm here every other week on Mondays at 2 o'clock p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii's Hawaii Together. In Hawaii Together, we talk with some of the most fascinating people in the islands about working together, working together for a better economy, government, and society. So I invite you into our conversation every other Monday at 2 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii Broadcast Network. Join us for Hawaii Together. I'm Kili'i Akina. Aloha. Okay, Mina, Marco, and me. We have Mina Marita on the phone from Kauai. We have Marco Mangelsdorf on the phone from California. And we're talking about energy in Hawaii. We've been talking about uh, gee, a bunch of stuff, but I guess most recently about um, tax credits and, and a letter ruling from the Internal Revenue Service just a few days ago on, um, the, uh, on credits for uh, installation of storage, which is an important issue. So, but we have a policy point here. We have a policy point about how, how much uh, do we want to encourage and incentivize storage, either at the homeowner level or at the utility level. And um, uh, Marco spoke about your views, Mina. And we, we have left it to you to articulate those views now on this policy point. Go for it. Yeah, so I am concerned about um, the use of taxpayer money, ratepayer money to subsidize individual home units. And, you know, part of that concern is a lot of these homes have already benefited through um, existing tax credit plus um, the net energy metering tariff for many years. So it's like giving the same people the, uh, an, another set of breaks, um, uh, subsidization breaks by um, a, a separate uh, storage tax credit. I mean, I... You know, I, I support storage. You know, I, I think it's one of the, the many tools in, in um, our kit to get us closer to a um, low-carbon future. But, you know, we, to me, the major issues here are the grid modernization and um Getting help for the majority of uh, rate payers through not only cleaner energy but stabilizing costs. Uh, so, which one? Which one you prefer? Which do you prefer 
um, rooftop storage for uh, you know, you know uh, residents, or do you prefer government, or rather utility storage? I'd, I'd rather see it subsidized on the utility side, and should um, should someone want um, to install storage, they they should be looking at the GEMS fund and and through uh, you know lower interest uh, loans um, to help incentivize. Um, well. Uh, storage system. A footnote uh, footnote you know, to that is the GEMS fund is is disappearing rapidly. Fifty fifty million dollars was sliced off last year, and I think mm -hmm. another fifty million be sliced off this year. And we finish, there'll be fifty yeah. million, only fifty million left. Um, starting from one hundred and fifty, we're now going to have fifty. I mean, assuming these bills pass. But Marco, what what do you think? What's your view of this policy point? I look to places like Puerto Rico that six months after Hurricane Maria, there are still an estimated 30 to 40 percent of Puerto Rico residents who are without regular stable power. And if someone had told people of Puerto Rico a month, which would be August, uh, August of last year, that a hurricane was going to come along and wipe out their infrastructure, their electrical infrastructure for six months to a year to longer. Uh, of course, uh, people would have kind of said, well, that's just, we, you know, we live with that, probably won't happen. So I happen to see a, well, I certainly understand and appreciate Mina's perspective on that in terms of that you have people with PV systems who, who have been subsidized uh, uh, generously through net energy metering. I'm one of them. I'm one of them. As well as state and federal tax credits. Again, I'm one of them, both my business and as an individual. So there is a selfish parochial interest, of course, on the part of companies like mine to want to uh, open up a new market segment in terms of adding storage to existing systems. Absolutely. I, I fully cop to that. But I think the argument can also be made honestly and legitimately that adding storage, both utility scale and micro storage uh, behind the meter, at people's homes and businesses provides a resiliency, a redundancy, and a greater security uh, against an inherently vulnerable electric grid, island to island to island, that is subject to, at any given time, a hurricane Niki type of experience that could have a devastating impact. And I believe that those, uh, those benefits outweigh the counter argument saying, well, we shouldn't continue to subsidize those who've already been subsidized before. I think there, there, are, there are goods and benefits that accrue to the collective of everybody hooked up to the grid by deploying storage faster than, uh, than slower. Mm -hmm. So would you... So I, I don't I don't think we have a disagreement about building a, a system for resiliency. The big question is who pays and who benefits. And right. you know, what I'm saying is when you have a limited pot of public funds, those funds should be used to the best way possible to go to the greater public good which is probably storage on the utility side, storage on public buildings where there's more access, um, readiness um, uh, for hospitals, shelters, areas where resiliency is critical rather than subsidizing individual homes where there is no public uh, or, or minimal public Benefit. So am I, I mean, right to that, say that you both feel that there ought to be incentives on both sides, that is utility and private homes, um, but uh, Mina feels that there should be more incentive on the utility side and less on the public, on the private homes, and Marco feels oh. there ought to be more uh, incentive on the private homes and less on the utility. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, I mean, for me, it. We've got limited pots of money here, and the focus should be 
where there's the greatest public benefit, and it's probably on the utility side and public facilities rather than individual homes. Well, how does this comport uh, with the... Me, how, you might add me, in your comment, me, though, Marco, how, how this comports with the legislation that is now wending its way through the legislature this year. Well, there is, in fact, there would be, uh, the current language in SB 2100 would also provide uh, much uh, larger amounts uh, and gross sums in terms of uh, subsidizing larger scale storage. So it, it's not just 25% or 5,000 for residential, it's also storage uh, at a much larger scale. Let me kind of ask a cut to the chase hypothetical question, Lamina. So, Lamina, if you were back at your old job as chair of the Energy and Environment Committee, and you got 2100 landed in your lap, would it be your, uh, your intention? Would you go ahead and essentially strike that portion of 2100 that would provide state tax credit support for individual residential storage? Would you, would you do that? A new tax credit? Because we, you know, Hawaii for a long time already had a letter ruling where the existing tax credit includes energy storage. So if you design your system yeah, but, correctly, you you would have already included this, energy storage. And but and this so is I, this, I, this, this, sorry. Go ahead, go ahead, Mark. Go ahead, please. No, I mean, please. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Finish. Yeah, so again, having a, a separate tax credit for um, homes that have already benefited from the REITC um, to, to be able to take a separate tax credit, I think it's, and then plus on top of that, has benefited um, through the NEM program. I mean, it's a, it's a triple dip for the same people. Mm. Marco? So you would, it sounds like you would, in fact, not pass out of your committee, if it was your choice, you would not pass out of your committee providing a new state tax credit to subsidize with state general fund dollars to subsidize the addition of storage to existing portable take systems. You would not, you would not pass that out of your committee. I, I don't support it. Okay. Okay. Ma Marco, Thank would you, you. you support it? I guess, yeah. I do. I do. Well, let me let me uh, just go to one other point before we break. And uh, there are various bills pending about energy in in the 2018 legislature, but one of them uh, seems to be a bill that has come and gone before without success, and that is to uh, make changes in the PUC. Any thoughts about that bill? Uh, what are its provisions, and what are its likelihood? What is its likelihood of passage, and do you support it? I haven't looked at the um, the most recent version of the bill and haven't been participating in it. But, you know, I, I do believe in diversity of the PUC. I do believe that the um, there needs to be um, support for the staff and the commissioners in dealing with these complex problems that the this regulatory body takes up. I, 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 a lot of it is dependent on the chair and how the chair administers the, the PUC. And in looking at the current audit that came out a couple weeks ago, it appears to me, and this is my personal opinion, that a lot of the um, policy decisions have been um, kicked to the executive director from the chair. And that sort of bothers me because my understanding of the executive director's position is strictly administrative and 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 not policy. So uh, some of the things that concerned me was, you know, allowing the uh, executive uh, director to 
um, look at the strategic goals and objectives and formulate the strategic goals and objectives without any kind of real discussion. Mm -hmm. um, um, you know, we're almost out of with, time, Mina. We're almost out of time. I want to give Marco uh, the last word on this issue. Do <laughs> you have any comments on this bill, Marco? Yeah. Then we got to close. Uh, but candidly, I don't know enough about it to really make much of a comment. I can only kind of channel channel our friends at the Public Utilities Commission and the idea of kind of being overhauled. Uh, I can't imagine finds a whole lot of favor uh, within uh, the confines of that particular uh, department, I would think. Okay, maybe we can discuss and go deeper into this uh, if it's still alive uh, on our next meeting two weeks from hence. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mina Morita and Marco Mangelsdorf, for this discussion. Mina Morita and me on Energy on Monday. Uh, aloha, and we'll see you soon. Take care.